Another complementarity between drones and, and satellite is in, in weather forecasts. I've shown you that uh, uh, satellites are, are essential at the core of the providing this uh, global low resolution uh, global forecast which are then sent to national uh, weather uh, forecast units which will reprocess the the data provide additional local measurements and deliver the your your national uh, weather built in on television at night and then it can go to a uh, narrower and narrower scales that's the beauty of the uh, of the uh, the mathematics involved in the models of uh, weather forecast but the the condition for doing this is uh, is that you have to add local uh, high precision measurements otherwise with all the mathematics of uh, of the world you will not get a higher resolution more than what your low resolution uh, your large scale model provides so additional measurements are required and in particular what's critical for local phenomena is what happens in the boundary layer in the first two kilometers that's when you go from the ground to uh, the, uh, the global uh, circulation in the atmosphere and having a very good description of this uh, first two uh, thousand meters of the atmosphere is absolutely essential for uh, improving the accuracy of your forecast and, and, and forecasting some specific parameters. And a Swiss company called uh, Meteo Drone has developed this uh, instrument, which is essentially a drone which is making vertical profiles up to 2,000 uh, meters. They actually, it's actually the only drone which is allowed to, uh, to fly in the uh, uh, non-segregated airspace uh, by the uh, air traffic control uh, uh, authorities in Switzerland and they're making the, these vertical measurements and they can make, as you can see on the left part, they can make tens of these vertical measurements so over a day and get a very accurate description of this boundary layer where you, you can see uh, where the structure is sometimes very uh, very fine and highly variable and it's the uh, measurement of this structure and the introduction of these uh, measurements in the models which will uh, allow the weather uh, forecast people to forecast phenomena such as thunderstorms, fog, uh, which are very sensitive to these uh, local phenomena and this boundary layer structure. And uh, so it's a significant improvement for uh, airports, for uh, sailors and uh, and also, I mentioned earlier, um, for wind farm operators, what is needed is the wind as, at 200 meters. And usually what the, uh, what the uh, global weather forecast will provide is an average measurement of the wind and not exactly the wind where uh, the wind turbines will be operating. So with such a, a combination of satellite observation and drone observations in the, of the boundary layer, you can actually provide this kind of uh, accurate uh, local uh, forecast of the wind. Again, another uh, B2B application of space uh, data, this time in combination uh, with drones. Precision farming is an area with another of these applications of space, which has been developing over the last uh, 10, 20 years. Uh, where satellite observations will give you an indication of the quality of your field, of the amount of water, of the potential possible deficit in, in nutrients and, and phosphates and nitrates. Uh, and then, of course, uh, with the combination of these maps, uh, in situ sensors, satellite communication and satellite navigation, you can almost operate your, uh, your engines on the, on the field without any um, human intervention and stop making uh, farming on large scales uh, with uh, I mean, automate the farming system. So this is another B2B service which is essentially supported by satellites. The problem often with the service is again resolution, uh, revisit, 
you're not, the frequency of observation is not sufficient for actually managing efficiently the field, whether it's actually a field or a fish farm. And, and in that case, um, and this is a fish farm, uh, for fish farms, the issue is uh, essentially the chlorophyll content of the water as well as the, the, the temperature of the water. And both can be provided by satellites, but again, not necessarily at the right resolution and not necessarily with the, the, the appropriate revisit time. That's where uh, drones can complement. And here is a, a hyperspectral instrument which has been developed for a drone, which allows to, uh, to make this uh, hyperspectral measurements and provide these uh, this parameters at a much higher resolution with a much uh, smaller revisit time. And this is an example of a coastline monitoring provided by this drone and by this company, Gamaya, a drone and hyperspectral measurement company uh, in EPFL. The measurements were con conducted in uh, 2014. Uh, Finally, another extension of drones, which is now uh, exciting uh, a lot of people, is uh, uh, long duration drones. Drones which can remain uh, flying for, uh, for hours, possibly days, and even months. First of all, there's these low altitude drones. All of them, the characteristic, if you're flying for a long time, the problem of autonomy on a drone is batteries. So the solution is solar power. You put solar panels on the drones and in that, uh, that way you should, in principle, be able to fly for a longer time. This is an example. This is a drone, a solar powered drone, which is developed by Zurich University and uh, which, would, uh, which is planning to demonstrate its uh, long range capability by crossing the, uh, the Atlantic from Lisbon to, uh, to Boston. But, uh, such a drone uh, can actually carry uh, instruments like the hyperspectral instruments from Gamaya that I presented earlier or atmospheric sensors and can provide the kind of high resolution uh, measurements that are needed or the kind of uh, observations uh, uh, needed for precision farming over large uh, areas. And finally, the next uh, big development, uh, which uh, is, um, is as I say, uh, around which uh, a lot of people are excited today, which is this project of flying solar-powered drones at very high altitude in the stratosphere, essentially at uh, above 20 kilometers. The, the advantage is that above 20 kilometers, you're outside of the airspace, so that you can remain there you're not too worried by the other airplanes. And, um, and there would be uh, plenty of applications, so that is why there's such a race for these uh, high altitude uh, solar powered um, drones. Uh, Facebook has uh, bought a company in England called Ascenta, and they've, uh, they're quite advanced in the development of their drone, and they're waiting for flight uh, permission to, uh, to start testing. Google has started the, uh, the same with a company called Titan in New Mexico and uh, they're still struggling with the with stability of the engine. Airbus has made uh, testing on the Zephyr. The Swiss are trying to develop an extension of the solar impulse, solar impulse with a uh, solar powered airplane with two pilots, so the idea would be to remove the pilot and uh, make it fly at a higher altitude. So these are just a few of these projects. There are also projects to fly balloons in the, in the stratosphere. And why is there so much interest? Essentially because this internet from the sky could be provided by these instruments. Imagine you have a, a balloon, a permanent uh, platform, or even long high altitude permanent drone flying in uh, at uh, 20 kilometers um, and making circles, then you can put a GSM uh, transmitter and then provide uh, 3G uh, connectivity uh, through your usual smartphone 
uh, from a fixed spot in the sky rather than being uh, be, rather than through uh, an antenna somewhere. So in places where uh, uh, where um, uh, again optical fibers and uh, connectivity does not exist, and typically what uh, with these big companies are targeting is connectivity to Africa. These um, solar powered. Uh, high altitude drones would be a, a solution to, or an alternative solution to this internet uh, from the sky to this uh, space race 2.0 as I call it uh, and but again this would be a local solution for one particular city where there, the, there's a lot of people it will never provide this uh, global coverage that uh, satellites are providing today another uh, connection between satellites and, uh, and drones and another reason why uh, the satellite uh, sector is paying attention to drones is the moment you start flying drones uh, over a, a very long time and over a very long range those long endurance drones well then you will have to provide communication because they will fly beyond radio line of sight so direct communication between the drone and the operator on the ground will not be possible and it will require, the communication will require to go through the satellite. So the drone will transmit, transmit to the satellite and the satellite will then connect with the operator on the ground. So drones are carrying a GPS. Drones are doing imagery and sometimes using satellite imagery to complement with their own measurements. And drones will need uh, satellite telecommunication in the future to, uh, uh, to uh, provide this uh, long range capability. So drones will be companions uh, to, to uh, space, uh, to satellites, and drone technology will be closely entangled with, uh, with satellite technology in the future. That's why we are, we are paying a, a lot of attention. So then uh, I wanted to, uh, to conclude, to, to give you, just show you just a few applications that uh, are applications of space, really unexpected, or application of drones, or application of a combination of, uh, of them. And, um, and I've already showed you several examples throughout the, uh, the presentation. Here, just to conclude, are a few ones which are highly unexpected and uh, this is for instance it's an electronic bracelet for the monitoring of uh, and the monitoring and the uh, uh, rehabilitation and uh, of uh, convicts and uh, people who are under electronic surveillance well this is a space application because it contains a gps and and now more and more uh, we uh, these companies are working towards uh, providing satellite communication as well so that the connectivity would not be lost if the uh, people under the monitoring would go uh, beyond the reach of uh, local uh, GSM uh, networks. And actually also using satellite imagery because in some countries uh, in order to uh, locate the, uh, the, the bracelets it's important to have not just the maps which sometimes are not really completely accurate in dealing in countries or in the, in, in the country or when the, um, I mean the, the land is constantly uh, transforming. So uh, having images to complement the service is, uh, is also useful and this is uh, what uh, they are doing. Technically speaking, this is a wonderful spin-off of, uh, of Swiss uh, clock making uh, or precision uh, manufacturing. and. Uh, for that, it's uh, some remarkable applications. Another uh, application, just to, to illustrate the variety of what you can do with, uh, with all these space technologies, is something we're using in ski resorts in, uh, in Switzerland uh, and Austria uh, to manage the snow, manage the skiers, manage the traffic, and uh, operate uh, and ensure safety in the resort uh, using satellites. Really. Uh, uh, you, there, there are so many things you can do with uh, satellites, with uh, observations, with communication, with positioning. Uh, that uh, if you are, if you have an uh, uh, an idea, if you're creative, if you want to uh, work on it, 
please uh, uh, go ahead. Space has been, uh, uh, I mean, we've invested in space, we've created space uh, infrastructure over the last 50 years. Now this infrastructure is there. It's developing even faster with this new space approach and the development of uh, new technologies. Uh, and clearly, if you have uh, ideas for applications of existing technologies or uh, ideas for developing new technologies, there are so many opportunities and always remember that space has no limit. Thank you very much.